ships fled their homes With sorrow and with prayer they carried sacred wares And launched into the great unknown No one ever again saw the men who fled to keep their faith alive but every now and then across the land People spoke of where they lived and died In seven cities of gold Seven cities of gold It was not too long ago that Estevan Nico claimed to have found the sight. He said before his eyes he saw a city rise. It was the fabled golden paradise. They visited again the newfound land with Denise of the Franciscan priest. Estaban Eco met his death, but with his final breath, he spread the curse, fatal disease of seven cities of gold. Seven cities of gold. They searched for seven cities of gold the curse it's seven cities of gold were made of stone and our people to him seemed oh so poor they came in like a flood to spill our blood and demanded food shelter and wives they made us into slaves to dig our graves and to pray for what they couldn't find seven Cities of gold They searched for seven Cities of gold They died for seven Cities of gold The curse said seven Cities of gold
We have many origins as indigenous people, but the origins of the European story of America, the commonly known European story of America, it begins in 1492. In 1492, Columbus sails the ocean blue. He's sailing for Spain. Spain is in a little bit of a wrestling match with uh, the neighboring country of Portugal at this time. Really, all the European nations are in a little bit of an obsession with the spice trade in the Orient. You know, um, whoever can get the monopoly on that spice trade really can uh, create uh, a lot of bank for their particular country. Columbus is the one that had this brilliant idea that if he sails to the west, he can eventually reach the east if he goes around the globe. You know, maybe a little bit uh, off in his calculations, but you know, sound in his theory. He was denied in his native Italy, and so he went to Spain where he was denied until Spain defeated Grenada. And then after that, the crown showed him favor and supplied him with three little ships, the Nina, the Pinta, and the Santa Maria. And he crossed the entire Atlantic Ocean, really amazing feat actually, but he lands on the island of Hispaniola, confused, thinking he's in the, in the Indies, he refers to the indigenous people as Indians. Columbus begins the European invasion on the island of Hispaniola. From there, the conquest of America goes into Mexico. And it's very interesting to me that initially, initial contacts with Native American people were often Europeans experiencing the hospitality of indigenous people. When Cortez went inland into Mexico, he was greeted as a very special guest because among the tribes of the Southwest and Mexico, believe it or not, in our outlook and in our cultural prophecies, we've been expecting, you know, the return. And yes, in our theory, the return of the Pahana, the return of the white man. But when Cortez came, you know, and other conquistadors into the land of the Southwest later, you know, they proved to us that they weren't who we were expecting, you know, because the people that we were expecting were to be a people that had knowledge and brotherly kindness and brotherly love, you know and wisdom and understanding. Uh, these guys had greed. Mexico was pillaged for its gold. South America was pillaged for its silver. The conquest of America from there goes into the two corners of what we call the United States, the southern corners of what we call the United States today. The Narvaez expedition went into Florida around 1528 and was shipwrecked and of all the hundreds of men that were part of that expedition, all died but four souls. And one of those was Cabeza de Vaca. Another one was a slave, a slave from Morocco, an African, who was referred to as Estavanico. These men traversed the entire continent from Florida all the way to the west coast and then back down to Mexico. They crossed the Rio Grande River three times. It took them many years to get back to Mexico City, but when they got there, they spread the stories of what I referred to in the first song, which is called Seven Cities of Gold. This was a legend in Spain that somewhere out there in the Atlantic Ocean, there were seven cities of gold. When the Muslims, the Moors, invaded Spain, it's legend that seven bishops fled with all of their riches somewhere out into the Atlantic. And the theory was that somewhere on the continent of North America, these seven cities still existed. In 1540, Estabanico, the slave, led an expedition with Friar Denisa up into uh, New Mexico, actually 1539. And uh, strange twist of history, you know, the first white man that the Puebloan people saw was not a white man. He was a black man. 
big twist of uh, history in that matter, you know. Estevanico violating religious taboos was slain in the Pueblo of Zuni. And the next year, the Coronado expedition came out in search for these seven cities of gold. He was very disappointed, but we always had the gold here in the Pueblo country. They were looking for it, they left disappointed, but we always had it. But the grain of gold was in corn, you know, that was our true treasure and still is, you know, to this day. That is our sustenance. That's where we carry our prayers. That's where we gather our names from, you know. That's how we're born into this world uh, through our corn mothers and corn fathers. Racism in America has four distinct elements. Number one is capitalism. Racism was built 
on capitalistic greed, you know. That's what the conquistadors came to discover, is gold. But another one of these elements is a cloak of Christianity. So many of the atrocities done to Native American people were excused by religion because we didn't have the same system of religion for some reason in their thinking that gives them a cause to persecute us and then to justify it in the name of spreading their gospel through their domination. Another element of racism at its roots in this hemisphere, classism. The class segregation or the class breaking point. If you have white skin, then you're in that higher class. If you don't have that, you know, then your lands are subject to being taken. You know, you have no rights even on the lands that you live upon, the land that your ancestors lived upon, you know, for centuries. The other foundation, twisted foundation of racism in this country is colonization. 1598, Oñate comes from Mexico to colonize New Mexico. And when he comes to colonize New Mexico, he sets up the second European settlement in the United States. The first one, 1565, St. Augustine, Florida. The second, San Gabriel, New Mexico in 1598. These are both prior to the colonies of Jamestown and Plymouth on the East Coast. So this is a statue of Oñate and maybe you've heard about that in Northern New Mexico and Santa Fe and Albuquerque, you know many people have been crying out against the presence of these statues which is really an emblem of imperialistic domination over indigenous people. Oñate to our people was a butcher. We were under the inquisitional rule of Spain in northern New Mexico, northern Arizona for 80 plus years between 1598 and 1680. Santa Fe is considered to be the longest used capital city in the entire United States being established in 1610. It actually wasn't established in 1610 because it was a Tewa village that was taken over in 1610. It was probably, it was probably established more like 1300. But there in Santa Fe, on that Santa Fe Plaza that many probably of you have been to, to visit, right there on the plaza, that plaza was a place of public execution. That plaza was a place that our people shared their blood, not once, not twice, not three times, but over and over and over and over again in its history. In 1675, there was a public hanging of medicine men and a public scourging of those accused of lesser crimes. One of those men that was accused of lesser crimes was a Tewa medicine man by the name of Pope. Pope relocated to the most northern village, which is Taos, New Mexico. And there he received from the Creator instructions about how to overthrow our oppressors. It was illegal for a Native American to own a horse under inquisitional Spanish rule in New Mexico and Arizona. So news of this revolt was carried via relay runners bearing knotted cords. And he gave instructions to these runners to tell the war chiefs of every village to untie a knot from that cord as the sun rose every day. July the 4th of 1776 is considered here in the United States of America to be Independence Day. To us, August 10th of 1680 is what we consider our Independence Day because it was on that day that our people rose up against their oppressors. The last knot was untied and all throughout New Mexico, all throughout Arizona, the indigenous people rose up and overthrew their oppressors. And I say this really with all humility. You know, for the sake of ourselves and for the sake of those indigenous people that have suffered all throughout history of America, all throughout this country, and even are today. After the establishment of colonies in the Southeast and in the Southwest, 
you move into the 17th century, and now you finally have those English settlements. You have Jamestown that is established in 1607, established by the Virginia Company. 1620, the establishment of Plymouth Colony. And again, very true to form, the indigenous people offer a helping hand, and this is very famous story about how Massasoit and his people really saved the pilgrims from destruction by teaching them how to plant, teaching them how to survive on the land that they were uh, not familiar with. And uh, the following generation, the generation after Massasoit, Massasoit's son, Philip, he was beheaded by the pilgrims. His head hung in Plymouth Colony for 20 years as a warning. Philip's son, Massasoit's grandson, the grandson of the man who offered the helping hand to the pilgrims, he was sold into the Caribbean islands to work in the sugar fields. Again, going back to that capitalistic focus, Columbus introduced sugarcane into the Caribbean islands, which became part of a big gigantic triangular trade. Sugarcane being cultivated in Brazil and in the Caribbean islands, being processed into molasses, then traded up into the English colonies, made into rum, into alcohol, then traded for souls, alcohol for souls, down on the African continent. And the whole cycle starts all over again. This was a steamroller engine, these European colonies coming in from the east, pushing indigenous peoples back and further back and further back. They introduced European systems, European philosophies of land ownership, and our people were cheated out of their homelands. After willingly sharing their spaces, after willingly sharing their knowledge about how to live on these lands, visited Washington DC a while back, visited the Museum of Native American at the Smithsonian, had a chance to perform there, but looking at those exhibits and the treaties that took place, you know, it's disgusting. It's heartbreaking. From one museum, the Smithsonian Museum of the American Indian, over to the Museum of the Holocaust, and you realize that there's two Holocausts in American history, you know. Those that we were seeking to liberate during World War II and those that we inflicted genocide upon in America. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said, America as a nation was really formed in genocide when it looked at indigenous people as an inferior race. This song is dedicated to all of those whiskey treaties. Let them rot.
indigenous American or what links the human soul to the earth. The Native American believed that this land was given to us by the great spirit and that by living in harmony, we would live here forever. But the new world, this is what the white man called this land. But it was not new at all. America, land of the First Nations for centuries. Nation to nation with banners of blessing Brave and broken hearts for what the children are facing It was a whiskey cheap that gave in to your greed When it's out of way, it's life and so the soul of the deep As long as grass are growing, when I'm through Maybe it's coming, season go Beaks are like a river, be flowing low But the grass are growing, when sick And the wind don't blow in the midst of the fall The conquest of America, the English version, starts on the East Coast, begins to make its way into the wild, wild west. The dispossession of Native American nations. Think about it. In 1776, when America declared its independence from England, America claimed to acknowledge that all men are created equal, endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. Among these, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Unfortunately, it seems in this American experiment that you kind of had to have white skin for that to apply to you. Native American people fought in world wars for this country, for a country that they weren't even citizens of, you know. As that um, English expansion makes its way, they coined the term manifest destiny. Again, another one of those Christian cliches to justify the butchering and the slaughter and the genocide of indigenous people. This is a song about the Navajo Nation because as the English version came across into this land. In 1864 through 1868, they rounded up the Navajo Nation, took them to Bosque Redondo where they imprisoned them in an early concentration camp here in America. 2,000 of the people died there, one third of the population that was imprisoned there before they were finally released. It's a song called Tasavum, a song about the Navajo Nation. Seems to me that there's no 
terms of peace when our societies were living in a manifest destiny. culminated in Standing Rock in 1890. Sitting Bull invited the ceremony initiated by Wovoka, the Paiute prophet from up here in Nevada, invited the ceremony that was referred to by outsiders as the ghost dance because it was a dance to honor those that had gone into the next world. Those of our loved ones that over the centuries had succumbed to disease, had been murdered by the American machine, those of our people that had gone into the grave from sickness, from hunger. This dance was done to honor them with the hope of a better tomorrow. To be a participant in the ceremony, one had to swear off of alcohol and to make a commitment to not initiate violence. In 1890, when this ceremony came to Standing Rock, there was a swelling of the population. The government sent in soldiers, surrounded the camp. Kind of sounds familiar. They 
arrested Sitting Bull and actually executed Sitting Bull at the same time. The many people fled into blizzard-like conditions in December of 1890. The army pursued them, encircled them, disarmed them, and then fired upon them. 47 survivors, 300 dead, buried in a mass grave. 47 survivors, four men. The rest, women and children, were taken into a church in the community of Wounded Knee. They were assigned an army physician, a Civil War surgeon, who said, this is the first time I've ever seen women and children shot to pieces like this. I can't stand the sight of this. This is the scene that closes the Native American wars. Children, women, shot to pieces.
Nate is getting restless. Last decade of the 1800s, at the close of the Indian Wars, so-called Indian Wars, the English version of America has now made its trip all the way out here to northern Arizona into the wild, wild west. And now they focus their attention on this forgotten group of people up in Hopi land. We're first contact people in this area. We're also last contact people. We warred for our freedom. We won our freedom back in 1680. We live in the oldest continuously inhabited communities in all of North America. We've never been relocated, but the government came in and demanded that we send our children to boarding school thousands of miles away to Pennsylvania to a boarding school whose stated policy is kill the Indian, save the man. Our mothers were taken from us. Our fathers were taken from us. And in the midst of this calculated attack upon our families, upon our language, upon our culture, the government comes in now demanding us to create constitutional governments in their image so that the mining companies can come in and negotiate for mineral rights. This is a song about home. This is a song called Hopi Land. Hopi Land, if I forget you, fire not gonna come from me tongue. Hopi Land, if I forget you, let my right hand forget what it's supposed to do. Hopi Land, if I forget you, fire not gonna come from me tongue. Hopi Land, if I forget you, let my right hand forget what it's supposed to do. In the ancient day, doing a migration way, following the sign that you provide with no delay. We've been traveling from a place to place, seeking understanding by what the spirits say. Ten thousand years in the land of the free and the want me to give for my right to property. Don't you see? It never belonged to you and me. We were given permission if we live in harmony. Open land if I forget you. Fire not gonna come from me tongue. Open land if I forget you. Let my right hand forget what it's supposed to do. The Castilum come in 1540. Years gone by, about 60. When we were burned in the oven in the 17th century. And I'm trying to conquer, but I can't conquer. I will not lie down, I will not fall asleep. I remember how they had our brothers in captivity. Took the children, erased their memory, changed their name and their identity. Remember who you are. Exploitation for their filthy money, we all know that's not the way to be. And hope it land if I forget you. Fire not gonna come from me, tongue. Hope it land if I forget you. Let my right hand forget what it's supposed to do. Hope it land if I forget you. Fire not gonna come from me, tongue. Hope it land if I forget you. Let my right hand.
with one voice, one song. If one love could lead the way in, one light could guide our way. With one heart, we'd carry on with one voice, one song.